gold is one of the wonders of the natural world. Its beauty captures our hearts and minds. But the value of gold awakens our greed. We will go to incredible lengths to get it. Gold drives war and conquest. And for the conquered, it brings violence and slavery. It has built and destroyed empires. in the Peruvian Andes, and people are starting a long day's work. Santa Filomena is miles from anywhere. Over the past 20 years, this settlement has grown up for one reason only, gold. Fifteen hundred men, women and children live and work here. More arrive every week. In the heart of Santa Filomena is an old gold mine, abandoned by an American mining company in the 1950s. There is still enough gold in the rock to send men down the old shaft. Deep underground, they collect it by hand and carry it back to the surface. It's hard and dangerous work. Here, the struggle for gold is not about riches, but survival. Pero en general lo que tienen en común es que la minería artesanal se desarrolla en lugares donde hay, eh, digamos, bastante pobreza. ¿no? O sea, es una actividad altamente riesgosa, pero que la desarrollan familias que realmente necesitan un espacio de trabajo. At the surface, the long process of extracting gold begins. The rocks must be broken down into tiny pieces. Stage by stage, the hard stone is reduced to gravel, then dust. There's little machinery at Santa Filomena. This industry is powered by human muscle. The rock is ground into a slurry. Men work through all the hours of daylight. Mercury is added to the slurry. The mercury combines with gold from the ground up rock. It forms a mixture known as an amalgam, which can be removed. All the gold from hundreds of liters of slurry and many man hours of work is contained in the amalgam. Simple detergent removes the last traces of impurity. When the amalgam is heated, 
the mercury begins to evaporate, leaving just the gold. Sixty kilograms of rock, four loads carried up from deep underground, a whole day's work stone breaking and grinding. At the end, just four grams of gold. Not every society has valued gold as we do. For centuries, people in sub-Saharan Africa had plenty of gold, but they lacked vital necessities for life, like salt. Arabs learned of the African gold over a thousand years ago. Rather than conquest, they turned to an even more effective weapon, trade they brought salt across the Sahara. When they reached the gold fields, they conducted an ancient trading ritual called dumb barter. The Arabs simply left their salt in a designated place. The two sides never met face to face. The Africans came out of hiding with their gold. If the Arabs were satisfied, the gold was theirs. With the deal done, the Africans could take the salt, something far more important to them than shiny metal. Camels allowed the Arabs to travel across the Sahara Desert in search of gold. Africa's Gold Coast was an Arab monopoly. Camel caravans across the desert became major trade routes. Gold flowed back to the Middle East. The Islamic world thrived as a great center of culture and business. Gold brought wealth to the caliphs and sultans. They lived in great splendor. Islamic armies conquered new territories. but it was their trading empire that became the most powerful in the world. By the year 1300, it seemed Islam was well ahead of the West. Europe could hardly have been a greater contrast. It faced a century of violence and disaster. Gold was often forgotten amid the catastrophe. It was described as the age of Satan. For a hundred years, war and civil unrest raged across the continent. Climate change brought colder and wetter weather. For three years in a row, the harvest failed. Western Europe suffered its worst famine ever. Then, a new terror spread from the east, bubonic plague. The Black Death spread rapidly. It killed a third of the people in Europe, a toll of at least 20 million. It would take three centuries for the population to rebuild itself, but the economic effect of the plague was surprising. 
there were fewer people to work. Laborers and tradesmen were in greater demand. Wages rose, people had more to spend. This fueled a consumer boom. Gold was in demand again to make more money. As mints across Europe increased production, supplies of gold diminished. By the mid-15th century, Europe had exhausted its known sources of gold. People began to look further afield. That meant going east to the legendary riches of Asia. 150 years earlier, Marco Polo had ventured overland from Venice to China. It had been a revelation. Marco Polo's writings were Europe's best intelligence about the mysteries of the Orient. He had marveled at the world he found. The Chinese were advanced, highly organized, and had plenty of gold. Marco Polo also described Japan, despite never going there. He talked of a large island with fair-skinned people, untouched by trade with the rest of the world. And gold, so plentiful, the Japanese even made palaces from it. He inspired a new generation of European explorers. Most famous of all, the son of a weaver from Genoa, Christopher Columbus. Columbus was a sailor and dreamer. He read Marco Polo avidly. The descriptions of Japan as an island with measureless amounts of gold enthralled him. Fired by this, he planned a radical voyage. Columbus wanted to follow Marco Polo to the east, but by sea, not land. Portuguese navigators had already sailed the length of Africa, entering the Indian Ocean and opening a sea route east to Asia. But Columbus was convinced he could sail west and reach Japan more easily. But he needed financial and political backing. Columbus visited royalty all over Europe with his plan. After years of trying, he won over Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain. Columbus signed a treaty with them, and his voyage of discovery could be made. Columbus set out west into the Atlantic with a crew of just 87. He had little but his faith and a copy of Marco Polo to guide him. After two months at sea, they touched land. It was not Japan, but a small island off Cuba. On the shore, they met natives carrying gold. Columbus was convinced he was now close to his goal, but he was disappointed. Anunciada Colon is a direct descendant of Christopher Columbus. She believes he knew he wasn't in Japan, but had stumbled across a new territory unknown to Europeans. Colón en, eh, se enteró, o, o conoció en, durante, en el primer viaje que había llegado a unas tierras, pero que obviamente o, para él era bastante manifiesto que él no era Asia, no es lo que estaba buscando porque él estaba intentando localizar eh, centros de mercado, donde hubiera mucho intercambio, mucha actividad mercantil. Y obviamente en el primer viaje él no encontró esos, esos centros de mercado. 
Columbus didn't let this new geography dampen his hopes for gold. His diaries mention it 65 times. They show he remained optimistic. From the great heat which I suffer, he wrote, this country must be rich in gold. Columbus made a further three voyages and set foot on a new continent, but he never found the large quantities of gold he dreamed of. He died an unfulfilled man. The King of Spain had sent him across the ocean to get gold at all hazards. Despite being remembered as the man who discovered America, the golden prize was won by others. It was Francisco Pissarro who took the quest for gold to new extremes. In Peru, the nation he conquered, he is remembered as the founder of the capital city, Lima. He was an adventurer, an illiterate maverick, but ruthless in his quest for gold. Pizarro made several journeys across the Atlantic. By this time, the Spanish had a colony called Hispaniola. From there, he was able to make his way south to an unexplored continent. When Pizarro and his 200 men landed in Peru, they had little idea what was ahead. This mountain land was home to the Incas. They had an advanced agriculture which supported a complex society. They could grow enough food to provide for a population of three and a half million. It was an organized and efficient culture. The Inca Empire was the most powerful civilization in South American history. It built towns, cities, and great roads across the mountains. But most important of all for the Spanish conquistadors, the Incas had gold. At the head of the empire was the Inca himself, Atahualpa. After landing on the Peruvian coast, Pizarro and his men made their way inland. It was a hard march across the mountains. Pizarro got word Atahualpa was in the town of Cajamarca. They made their way straight there. The conquistadors arrived in the town, but found no sign of the Inca and his royal court. It seemed strangely quiet.
Atahualpa and his nobles were in the nearby spa, relaxing by the hot springs after fighting a long and bloody civil war. Pizarro sent his brother to find the Inca. Atahualpa refused to meet them that day. Pizarro's envoys returned to the town. The Spanish hid in the main square. They spent an uncomfortable night. The 200 conquistadors knew there was an Inca army of thousands somewhere close by. The morning would bring a meeting of two civilizations. The following day, a massive procession approached the square. Lo que hay que tener presente es que Atahualpa no estaba con guerreros o soldados o guardaespaldas. Estaba rodeado de una multitud de danzantes, de bailarines, de juglares, de músicos, de actores que venían haciéndole fiestas al Inca. Porque el plan de Atahualpa era ese, hacer una gran fiesta y en ella eh, atrapar a Pizarro. Atahualpa was carried in on a golden litter. The square was packed with people. Pizarro's priest approached the Inca and offered him a Bible. The meeting was short. Atahualpa threw down the Bible in a rage. Pizarro signaled his men. Cuando se produce el primer malentendido y se grita Santiago, del cerro viene un tiro de arcabuz. Surgen los jinetes asustando a la multitud y desde a partir de ese momento se instala el pánico, el pánico masivo, el pánico de masas. The panic turned into a massacre. Los españoles mataron mucha gente. Los españoles hicieron lo suyo, pero la mayoría de gente murió asfixiada, uno aplastándose con otro. Atahualpa was seized from his golden litter. It seemed the impossible had happened. In one day, a small band of Spanish invaders had overpowered tens of thousands of Incas. Atahualpa was kept prisoner here for nine months. Talking to Pizarro, he soon realized the Spanish thought of little but gold. Este es el cuarto al cual lo traen Atahualpa prisionero y donde él permanece en estos aposentos nueve meses intentando recuperar eh, su libertad y eventualmente su imperio con el eh, pago de dinero. Pero fue lo suficientemente eh, astuto como para pagar con oro ajeno, con mucho oro. Atahualpa offered to fill his prison room with gold. He said it would reach up to a line he marked on the wall. He was true to his word. The Spanish were amazed as the room filled up. It was a bounty worth $270 million at today's prices. But Atahualpa was betrayed. The gold that he thought would save his life actually signed his death warrant. To the conquistadors, he stood in the way of Peru's riches. They executed him. With Atahualpa dead, the Spanish were free to conquer the rest of the Inca Empire. They marched on the imperial capital, Cusco. Without an emperor, the Incas put up little resistance. Cusco 
fell to the conquistadors. Its inhabitants faced torture and killing as the Spanish rampaged around the city. They looted its temples, shrines, and even its tombs for gold. Having stripped the city, they then set about raising it to the ground, destroying the center of Inca power. Pizarro had his golden reward, but not for long. The conquistadors quarreled. The conqueror of Peru was murdered by rivals. As he died, Pizarro is reported to have called to Jesus and then marked the sign of the cross in his own blood. Pizarro's legacy was immense. The colony he founded became part of the territories known as New Spain. These opened up vast supplies of gold. But building this new world was a cruel and bloody business. Many more thousands of Incas died in rebellions. The Inca people became little more than slaves, mining gold for their Spanish masters. One goal eluded the invaders, the lost world of El Dorado. Legend across South America spoke of whole cities of gold and even a lake sacred to the moon god filled with treasure. Many conquistadors searched, but El Dorado was always somewhere else. Perhaps a myth perpetuated by locals keen to get rid of the Spanish. El Dorado era el Perú. El Dorado era, era Cuba. El Dorado fue México. Una vez que se dan cuenta que esta gente quiere oro, como sea, y una vez que ya quiere que se vayan, lo mejor es decirles dónde hay más oro para que se vayan. Even without El Dorado, there was plenty of gold. For years, the Spanish shipped it back across the ocean. And the Spanish gold arrived in Seville. Seville became absolutely central to that whole flow of precious metals. And I think it's very interesting, if you stand on the banks of the river there in the early morning, I think you can imagine what the bustle must have been as the first galleons came up the river from the sea, and there the gold was offloaded. It more than doubled the world supply. Seville prospered and built monuments like the Torre del Oro, the Tower of Gold. And in its cathedral, a huge golden altar. It serves as a testament to how central gold became in Spanish culture at the time. So important, it was a fabulous religious symbol. But these shows of wealth conceal the problems that Spain had with all its riches from the New World. We now understand the true nature of the wealth that came into Seville and into the new Spanish Empire. The question is, how much good did that do Spain? What really happened to it? And I think the short answer is that to a large extent, the money was squandered. And this was squander of one of the biggest windfalls in history. The gold plundered and then mined in the Americas should have made Spain the economic powerhouse of Europe.
but the Spanish became involved in a series of failed attempts to assert their influence. The Emperor, Charles V, was convinced he could maintain a holy empire across Europe that would make Spain the bastion of the Catholic faith. He fought a series of wasteful wars, pursuing his dream. It's an interesting story because it repeats itself in the history of gold, that rulers and even wealthy people who thought they had it made when they had the gold almost always ended up in the ditch. It's, it's dangerous stuff. It's great to get, but it, it does something terrible to you. To make matters worse, the Spanish developed a taste for luxury goods imported from the East. Asia shipped out its merchandise in huge quantities. The Spanish paid in gold. The trade seemed to be one way. The Spanish may have wanted spices, silks, and porcelain from the East, but all Asians wanted was gold. And when they got it, they kept hold of it. Trade went on between the West and Asia, mostly for spices and textiles, and Europe shipping gold back to Asia. Economic theory says that if you get enough money, ultimately, you're gonna to wanna to do something with it. But the Asians just kept absorbing the gold, absorbing the gold. This seems to be a habit of, of Easterners that they're naturally savers and Westerners like to blow it. As Asia held on to all this gold, there was little left to invest in Spain's own industries and trade. The golden opportunity was lost. The ability of Asia to absorb gold remains today. In terms of world trade, India is still the largest importer of gold. The allure is partly cultural, partly practical. Gold is an important part of Hindu wedding ceremonies, but it's not just ornament. It can be hoarded, kept safe for hard times. While Asia sat on its gold, medieval Europe used it. Gold circulated daily as money. It was the backbone of trade. Great fairs grew up across Europe where all types of goods were bought and sold. A lot of gold changed hands. That became a problem. Merchants developed their own system of payments amongst themselves. They began to write notes to each other, promising to pay certain amounts of gold. They were like IOUs. Bills of exchange, as they were known, became quite complex. They began to replace gold in a lot of transactions and for good practical reasons. Pues que se ha transferido dinero desde Medina del Campo a Lyon, a Amberes, o desde Cartagena de Indias a Medina del Campo sin necesidad material de que eh, vayan eh, caballos, mulas, cargados con bolsas de oro y de oro y plata lo cual es muy engorroso y al mismo tiempo es muy peligroso porque es el ataque de posibles robos, eh, ataques de piratas, etcétera, etcétera. In the busy trade fairs of the time, bills of exchange caught on. They didn't just pay for goods, but began to change hands as if they were a currency in their own right. They worked because in the end they could always be changed back to gold. They made trade more efficient, and it flourished. La aparición del billete 
eh, es, eh, para que aparezca el billete es necesario que eh, los consumidores tengan confianza que ese papel tiene un valor. Y eh, para que tenga eh, un billete tenga un valor es que esté respaldado por una autoridad, una autoridad que es un banco. Y evidentemente un banco, eh, cuanto más fuerte, más seguro, más importante sea, mejor es el respaldo financiero. They were forerunners of modern banknotes. They weren't valuable in themselves like gold. They worked because the person or institution issuing them would honor them. They relied on trust and reputation. Early notes issued by the Bank of England were based on the good reputation of the bank to make payment if demanded. And this payment would be made with gold. The holder of a banknote could ask for it to be exchanged for gold at any time. The precious metal was still trusted above anything else. But banknotes were only used for large transactions. Gold and silver coins still made up most everyday money. Even coins made of precious metal rely on people trusting the mint where they are made. The Royal Mint built a reputation over centuries for coins that contained the right amounts of metal in the correct purity. But in the 17th century, this reputation was under threat. The threat didn't come from the mint itself, shortchanging the public with bad coins. It came from a widespread practice known as clipping. Taking just a little bit of the coin away doesn't drastically affect the weight. But when numerous people start to successively clip the coin, the weight is reduced dramatically. As it's the weight of the coin that gives it its value, then the coin no longer has the value of two shillings and sixpence, but probably, in this case, the value now is two shillings. The clippings could then be melted down and sold on as bullion, in some cases back to the mint itself. The damage to the integrity of British coins was serious. The secret weapon against the clippers was an invention from France. The mechanical coin press made the minting process much more sophisticated. Charles II ordered these machines for the Royal Mint. It's at that time that uh, making coins by machinery becomes the norm instead of the old-fashioned way of making coins by hand. It changes the whole nature of the mint from being like a series of craft workshops into a modern factory mint with an ordered sequence of operations. The new machines were installed at the home of the mint in the Tower of London. The screw press changed the direction of British coinage. A clever design modification was introduced to thwart the clippers. If you have a thin coin without a well-defined edge, you can't always be sure whether anything's been clipped from it or not. But once you have a machine-struck coin with a proper milled edge or a proper lettered edge, then the coins had a degree of protection against these people, the clippers, as they were, as they were called. But even with the new machines, most of the old coins in circulation were still clipped. The government came up with a bold plan. They would replace the whole currency. It was to be known as the Great Recoinage. But the plan caused chaos.
people panicked. They worried that the new coins wouldn't be worth as much. They held on to them. Business ground to a halt. There were even riots in some places. In the end, it took three years to complete the recoinage and even longer to rebuild trust in the currency. The Royal Mint hired a new man to help deal with the crisis. They made an interesting choice. Sir Isaac Newton is better known as a great scientist, but he worked at the Mint for 30 years. Newton brought his analytical mind to the problems faced by the Mint and by money in general. His work was to influence the way the economy in Britain and the rest of the world was run for generations. But Newton didn't just stay in an ivory tower at the Mint. He was also obsessed with stamping out the clippers. He kept a network of spies and informants across London's underworld. He bought intelligence so he could hunt down the clippers. Newton, for most of his life, was a recluse, a, a, a real kind of long-haired scientist in the laboratory. And all of a sudden, one day, he decided he wanted to be in the real world. Dropped everything he'd been doing, came to London, lived as a gentleman, uh, got himself a job in the Mint, and became master of the Mint. And as a result of that, became very interested in gold. And because he was a mathematician and a scientist, anything that he had to say on gold or, or economics, everybody listened to. Newton's greatest work came when he started looking at the financial relationship between gold and silver. This was always a tricky area. The relative prices between the two fluctuated. It was difficult to keep a stable currency, which could in turn upset the economy. Newton decided to fix the price of gold at a new level. The price he set remained more or less constant until the 20th century. Even though he may not have completely realized it, Newton had stumbled across an idea that became known as the gold standard. The fixed value of gold created a measure for everything else. The economy would revolve around gold. It was like discovering financial gravity. Gold would become the world's economic yardstick for over two centuries. It represented order and stability. and would protect humans from their own worst excesses. It seemed like a great solution. In Santa Filomena, gold is the cause of as many problems as the solution. Children play at processing gold, copying the work their parents do. Only a few years ago, child labor was a serious problem in Santa Filomena. But work still starts young. Gold production is everything here. There's nothing else. Repairing some of the damage done in the search for gold is the work of Katia Romero. Things used to be worse. 
la más importante de la situación de, de los niños, ¿no? y es que ellos serán el grupo más vulnerable, el más expuesto al, a la contaminación por mercurio, el más expuesto por la falta de, de escuela, entonces eh, van, van quebrando esa oportunidad ¿no? de desarrollarse, y también eh, el hecho de que sean involucrados de manera muy temprana al trabajo por no haber otros espacios de desarrollo para ellos. Now the settlement has a school, there's a chance that education can build a future away from gold. But it may not be a healthy future. Gold extraction here uses mercury. It is highly toxic in water, the soil and air, and to the touch. ¿Cuáles son los efectos? ¿no? Afecta el sistema neurológico, ¿no? eh, hace que pier se pierda capacidades en las personas porque afecta el, el, el sistema neurológico, se queda en la sangre y si, digamos, eh, estas personas no salen o no se retiran del espacio contaminado, puede llegar, pueden llegar a tener convulsiones, vómitos, una serie de, de efectos que definitivamente dañan, dañan su, su desarrollo ¿no? y puede llevar hasta la muerte porque es letal. Despite the poisonous mercury and derelict mine shafts, people still come to make their lives in Santa Filomena. Poverty and gold are powerful drivers. The lure of this metal is as potent in the 21st century as it ever was, and the costs are still high. In the next program, we reach the age of the gold rush. Prospectors strike gold in California. The world's supply increases five times over. Newton's gold standard becomes international. Gold helps to build a new industrial world. a time of trade and prosperity, a golden age, but would it last?